Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us wherever you're listening from and whatever platform you are listening on. Today's topic is one that many consider a lost art. If we discussed this topic years ago, it would have been a staple in pretty much everyone's offense. But as the game gets more and more spread out and many teams implement a five-out type strategy, a lot of teams have actually gone away with this entirely. And... We are talking about post play and working the post within your offense. So today, we are going to be talking to Coach Cassidy Kanemeyer, who's going to talk to us about how he uses the post and how post play fits within his offense. Coach, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure, you know, for our, uh, you know, being up north, being up here in Canada to uh, share some thoughts and ideas about uh, post play for our uh, American uh, neighbors down south. So thanks for having me on, Coach. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really looking forward to getting into this topic. So, Coach, let's let's go ahead and start with uh, sure. a little introduction to yourself and your journey, where where coaching's taken you, where you're at now, and and the stops in between. Well, my coaching journey, uh, my playing journey, ended abruptly after high school when I got cut at the uh, local college near me. Uh, so right away, I I got into uh, community coaching with what's called the Steve Nash Youth League, and up here it's like it's like, I guess it would be like the equivalent of like AAU basketball. So I was mm -hmm. coaching girls and then mixed teams because I had these really good um, female players at uh, the grade seven level. And, and they were so good at the in the girls league that we put them in the boys league with some boys and they were super competitive. And we started, uh, you know, it was very, it was an inner city league and here in Vancouver and it was a great league and a lot of actually players from that league that, I first coached and I ended up coaching against when I was, became a college coach later on in life. Um, but after the youth leagues, I coached um, an elementary school team at Granby Elementary where I worked after school programming when I was uh, at the University of British Columbia. So I was doing part-time work and going to school full-time. And so I coached their elementary school teams for a couple of years there and, uh, and then got a bit of a break. Uh, here in Canada, we don't get paid to coach uh, but those jobs were paid but paid jobs my first two positions which was really fortunate for me um, but then I got another I got a break like I said uh, coaching at um, the uh, Van Tech secondary which is uh, a high school uh, near the school I was you know coaching the elementary school kids at and one of the players that uh, was on that team it was a girls team um she was one of my referees in that Steve Nash youth, Steve Nash youth league. And she was like, she called me and um, she said to me like, look, like this is uh, I, we have a really good team here. We need a, someone that's organized that can, you know, get the best out of us. Um, and we'd really like you to come coach us and for our senior year, our grade 12 year. And there's um, all seniors except for one. I think there's two grade 11s and one grade 10, really good grade 10 uh, uh, player and we had a great season so much fun learned a ton and it was and it was fun too because it was right around the time I was doing my coaching psychology class at, at UBC and so I was able to kind of like cu cut a bit of my you know like coaching teeth in that league and we won a city championship uh, tier two city championship which is you know for uh, for that school it was a really big deal it's the only basketball banner in that school um, from there I went to um, Burnaby North Secondary, which is in a very tough division here in the city, um, where perennially uh, Burnaby South is in that division, and they are they just won the provincial title last year, and they've been to a couple of provincial finals, and uh, I think they've won. Yeah, I don't know how many provincial titles they've won. I think it's over two for sure in the last fifteen years. So they're perennial powerhouse, and so I wanted to coach in like a really tough division to kind of get a sense for uh, losing, basically. Like, I was winning at Van Tech, and I was coaching uh, at the elementary school level and winning, and, you know, I hadn't really lost a lot. Like, I lost one game 
you know, in a span of like, you know, three, four years. And I was like, okay, well, this is, you know, I feel like I'm a really great coach, but then you go into that harder division, you start losing. Right. And you, you start to really learn what kind of person you are as a coach, right? Like, you know, maybe when you're winning, you don't run, uh, you know, suicides as much, or you, you know, I run what's called sixes. So we do six down backs and in a minute and 20 seconds and like you know and when you're winning you don't run those and when you're losing you're like mm-hmm. well you know that last drill i don't know so you know you you, you do um find out who you are and, and then what you end up doing is you find out like a level of consistency so you're not this roller coaster ride with winning and losing mm. um and and i i really learned a ton from coaching at burning north because we would just get destroyed by that you know burnaby south team they had another school in that division, Burn Creek, Burnaby Mountain, all strong teams, all had college players that I ended up coaching against. Um, because after my two years at Burnaby North, I went to, uh, I got a job at Quest University, a paid, paid job as the uh, men's assistant coach at Quest University, which is really the equivalent of like a NAIA school down in, uh, in Arizona. Um, and we played in a great, uh, actually a great JUCO tournament um, Gosh, I can't remember the school's name, but it was like the JUCO League in Phoenix. Oh, okay. And they hosted, they hosted us uh, in my first year. And we did, the, you know, the Camelback Mountain. We went to Sun Devils. We went to watch um, the Outback Bowl or whatever it was. Yeah, where, yeah. Uh, University of Missouri, I think. Um, uh, what was his name? Blaine Gabbert was the, co- was the, was the quarterback right, in, right. in Missouri. And I mean, it's a beautiful stadium. Uh, Mill Avenue, right? And, yeah. Shout yeah, out to so, Tempe, Milev. Yeah, Absolutely. so we were we were down there and we loved it and we had a great tournament and it actually flipped our whole season because we were losing, um, you know, close games going into that tournament and that tournament really kind of made some of our players realize like you know shortcuts are you know this is what this is what happens when you shortcut like your systems this is what happens when you shortcut the defense and you shortcut your effort because you know down in uh, down south, when you go play down south, one the di- the biggest difference between uh, American university basketball and, and Canadian university basketball is those kids coming out of high school where you are just in such a bigger pool of players that um, they're so used to competing. And when they when the chips are down and um, they have to give their best effort and win with effort, they can do that. Whereas the Canadian kids have to learn how to do that. And and when they get to you know like we just don't have that big of a pool. So like when guys come out of high school here, um, they've maybe only played like five tough games in their whole high school career. Whereas down there, you might be playing a tough game every night. Mm. I mean, just cause the pool is just better. Uh, and the divisions are just better. And the coaching's probably, um, I don't want to say it's better, but like, I want to say that there's more young coaches and older coaches and more like, you know, paid positions and, right. um, you know, coaches that take their, their job very seriously right whereas up here it's volunteer it's a volunteer army of people that Mm -hmm. you know are giving back to the community just like i did when i started and um you know there's not a lot of professionalism in that like you're you're really you know you're on youtube you're you know you don't have a mentor coach you know you don't have anything uh luckily i uh took it i did take it seriously and i got uh, training while I was at Burnaby North and I did my, my level one, two, and three for free, uh, thanks to Burnaby North secondary, which was awesome. Cause you know, it opens your eyes. You're like, Oh my God, all this stuff I never even thought about. Right. And you get coached by national, you know, you get taught by national team coaches up here and it's great, great experience. And, um, at Quest University, we kind of, you know, coach shook and I, he's the, he's now the men's assistant at university of British Columbia. So he's really moved up from his, position as the head coach at quest to now the assistant coach at ubc it's a higher level Uh, but he was like the greatest mentor coach i could ever have because he was american and so uh one of the things i learned from him was or i learned so much from him but like you know you know he he was so detail oriented how do you inbound the ball right loved inbounding the ball overhead you know over your head pass Mm. he had every play he had had a counter play. First of all, I never understood plays really when I got there. Like I had a few, you know, maybe two plays. I ran dribble drive at Burnaby North, Burnaby North, but like at Quest, we had like a playbook. And for every play in the playbook, we had a counter, which is very 
much like uh you know more american than canadian like mm -hmm. in canada it's like you know you a lot of guys use like motion offenses and then they maybe have one or two sets whereas in the states it's like you know every high school team we ever played with our provincial team those teams had multiple actions that they could go to that the kids had done since they were like you know in junior high so right. anyways coach coach taught me a lot about um you know setting up counters uh, he taught me a lot about, um, you know, press breaking, um, you know, recruiting, um, what, you know, ordering gear, like where he liked to order gear from, which I still use his resource, you know, in my five years at Cap, like, you know, it's a great resource that he gave me, um, you know, how to manage players, you know, we had meetings after every practice and talked about you know how's this you know just evaluating all the talent that we had and and that program went from I think our first year we were seven and 14 our second year we were two and 19 and then after that we were we never lost more than um, I think six games okay. and, and we flipped the whole program around and we put our brains together and we brought in guys that were um, talented and smart and, and and that's really the way we built that program because the school itself was a liberal arts school with a high tuition that we couldn't cover the whole tuition for the players. So we had to get kids that were really smart that could get academic scholarships as well. So that's the way we kind of built that up. And then from Quest University, I got really fortunate and got a job at uh, Capilano University, which is in North Vancouver, about 15 minutes from my house on the highway. Amazing dream job. You know, it's, again, it, up here we don't have, in the college league, there's no full-time coaches. So I'm still a part-time coach, but mm -hmm you know, salary, which is amazing for my, me and my family. Uh, and, you know, I still have to add, I have my other job at the, at the Vancouver school board as a, as a teacher's assistant and, and I do the coaching at night. So uh, we've never, we've never won a provincial title at cap, but you know, we're going into year six and um, yeah, my journey is, is we've, we've had a winning record um, four out of my five years at cap. Uh, I've produced or I've helped produce one all Canadian, which is a big honor here. There's only uh, uh, 10 of them in Canada. Um, and we've won uh, a silver or we've lost in a provincial final. And so we've had a good, good run, not a great run. Well, no, it, 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 it sounds like, it, like you, you, you've had a, you, you've, you've had a quite the progression yourself from all the, the different stops that you you've been in along the way and, and, and your team, uh, it, it sounds like it's progressing as well. So it's almost like both you and, and the team are both going on uh, on the journey and the progression together, which which is which is great. And something that you Absolutely. said that I thought was really interesting was that uh, I, I had an interview. Uh, the episodes out for those listening, if you haven't listened to it, with uh, Coach Castillo about the UK and the US and uh, the the differences in was one of the questions I asked about some of the differences that he noticed. And one of the things he said was that the, the players that he has in the UK just aren't as competitive necessarily as the ones at the U S and then when they get U S guys, they're a lot more like a competitive and they're a lot more intense for a yes. lack of a better word. And it's really interesting that you brought up the same thing is that when you noticed the same thing, when you came down here to the States about the, just the level of intensity or that level of competition, I think that that's really interesting. And maybe a lot of listeners in the U S didn't, didn't really know that, that that's how they're kind of seen compared to other parts of the world. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, nothing can be uh, taken for granted against uh, U.S. players. Like, if you don't V-cut on the wing to start your offense and you just, you know, flat, just blast to the ball, you, you know, it's going to be a pick six the other way. <laughs> if you don't box out, the guy, you know, the guy that you didn't box out gets the rebound. If you don't dive for the loose ball, you're not going to get it. Um, just little, the little things that coaches love, like I think American uh, players in general, um, in my experience, do that quite well. Unless there's like, you know, I mean, there's a, it's not every time, but it's like, I would say it's nine out of 10 times when we play down there. Yeah, it's really fascinating stuff. Really interesting. And and so before we get into the, yeah. the topic with, with the, the, the post, uh, I want to talk about your yeah. uh, experience with U17 and then also with university coaching. One of the sure. things that I'm really interested about is that learning curve. And so in your experience, when you're working with U17 players who maybe have some aspirations or the ability yeah. to go to university, what's going to be that biggest learning curve that they're going to have to 
adjust to and prepare for if they want to make that leap to the university level? Um, well, that's a really good question. I mean, I didn't even mention that in the coaching journey. Yeah, I've done, we've done, um, I guess seven or eight years now with the provincial system. So I was an assistant for, for six and then now a head coach for two and I should have been a head coach for three, but then it got canceled this, this past summer. Um, when you're coaching 17s and 15s, like even at the 15 level, uh, so I've had 15, 16, 17s at every level. Um, the message is, is the same. It's, it's, you know, trying to give them perspective of their skill set at the next level. And so if you have like, you know, a plateau, uh, plateaued big, like a big that probably is already shaving and, you know, like looks like he's, you know, fully grown into his body. He's six foot seven, six foot six. Those bigs, like, you know, they're not going to get any bigger. Mm. right and right now at the 15 level they're dominating everybody like they're 230 pounds or six foot seven no one can handle them at all because everybody's still growing and so trying to speak to that kid and say look like if you don't develop your outside shot and you don't learn how to move your feet you're going to be like the third big on a youth sports roster or maybe a backup big at a college roster and being really like like square with them and and, and straight to the point because um, at, when they're dominating, getting 30 and 15 every night in the high school level, they think they're going to do, you know what I mean? Like they think yeah. they're going to, for the kids up here, they think they're going to UW and, and you have to tell them like, no, you're actually like, like if you can't cover a pick and roll and you don't, and you, you know, if you switch on a guard and you can't move your feet and you're just going to get blown by, you're going to have a hard time playing like period. Um, you know, for little guards like that are, you know, at the, at the U17 level that are, you know, freaks that are like so athletic and totally going in their body, but they're like five foot eight, like explain to them, like, you have to become a knockdown shooter. Mm. You have to get super strong because everybody's going to try to pick on you and see what you're made of, right? Every guard's going to try to take you on the box. Every guard's going to try to bully you down to the butt, you know, butt you down to the bucket. And, and are you going to be able to handle that? You know, we got to the, you know, like one, our provincial MVP from last, last year, Justin Sunga is a five foot nine, five foot 10, maybe uh, point guard. He's got a great wingspan, which I think is going to really help him defensively at the next level. But like him and I've had those, had those conversations for sure about like, and he's done it. Like that's the credit to him. He's listened to me and he's like gotten really strong. Like his body's really improved over, um, the two years that he's been playing high school basketball, he's going into his grade 12 year, but like, you know, you, you, you try to give them perspective of what their, what their, you know, possible role is. Mm -hmm. And if they want to exceed the role that you think that they are supposed to be in, these are the things they have to do. So really like laying out like a plan. Um, yeah, I think that's part, that's the first thing I would say to it. Yeah, well, I, I think that that's always something tough, I think, for, for younger athletes when they're so successful and they're doing so well at, at, at a younger age. But like you said, if it's because, you know, they're, they're six, seven, and they're just able to like dominate people, but their footwork isn't there, their foot speed or, or some of these other skills that you know are going to be essential. I know that sometimes it's, it's a little tough to have that conversation, but I think that the players who understand that and, and really take that to heart, those are the ones that probably see the most success uh, going forward, the ones who understand that they might be dominating uh, physically where they're at right now, but there's a lot of other finer areas that they're going to need to improve on also. Well, I think first, and I want to maybe just say to the listeners out there, like it's, mm -hmm. it is my personality to get to know my players first before I'll say something like that. Like the, and the big thing is, is like, you know, by the end of tryouts with the youth 15s to 17s, like you want, you know, like for us, like, like we try to, I try to make sure that every player kind of knows my personality and they know like, how I deliver um, uh, instructions, how I talk outside of instruction, um, you know, try to get to know a little bit about each player, you know, try to like, you know, you know, show my personality. And so when we get into practice and we get into, um, you know, training camp and stuff, the guys know who I am. They know what kind of person I am and they know that, um, I come from a place of care. Like I want, I care 
that they're going to have the next two years or a year or whatever it is to, you know, like work on the things that I'm telling them to, to have the best university career possible. Right. And, you know, like even in my best players that I've had, you know, my, I never say to them like, you know, Oh, you're great. You're going to be, you know, surefire, you know, team Canada. Like I've, you know, like we, we had a player, uh, a few years ago, and and I don't know if I mean I don't know how familiar you are with U Sports, but uh, we had a player named Grant Shepard who you know played on the junior national team, um, Kelowna from Kelowna, won a provincial title at Kelowna. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's really like one of the best big men ever from BC. Okay, and we, you know we've had Kelly Olenek, we've had Levon Kendall, we've had some great, okay. uh, we've had some great bigs, and Grant's on that level, like period. He's a guy that if he could you know shoot the three ball. And, you know, and he can't, I think he shoots 30% at the U sports level. So he's starting to shoot it, but he's a guy that is going to probably play team Canada when he's done his U sports career. And he's that high of a level athlete, you know, he can jump off both feet. He, you know, he can, you know, fill the lane. He can, he's got post moves. He's six foot nine and he's like a freak athlete, but like, you know, like I would get into him and I would say to him, like, look, like, if you want to play in the NBA, like you got to learn to dribble with your left hand. You can't, you can't, you know, like every time he went dribble handoff with to his left, he would turn it over because he'd put it in his right. Right. You know, like every time uh, he tried to go one on one against a, an elite athlete, he turned it over because his handle wasn't. So, so I was always on him about his handle. And, and I said, like, you know, and, and trying to project in my head where I thought he was, which is like the highest ceiling for Grant is probably the NBA to be honest. Um, you know, he could be one of the first youth sports players to ever do that. His trajectory right now, going into his third or fourth year, he just transferred to Carleton University, which is the best youth sports team in the country. His trajectory now is probably Europe, but he's going to be playing at one of the highest levels in Europe. Like, he's unreal. And so, as he's moved along, they've, you know, they've, they've you know, the, the other thing that I didn't mention was, you know, his shot, his outside shot, they've really worked on his outside shot. So now it's like he'll go to Europe and, or, you know, hopefully, and he'll be able to defend smaller players, shoot from the outside, as well as dominate on the block. So like mm -hmm. he's become quite the, quite the six foot nine uh, athlete, big man. So, I mean, I'm, at, at worst, he's going to Europe. Yeah. Well, I, I think that is such a key point that, that you mentioned about the, the relationship that you build and the relationship that you have with your players and that if you are going to have to give them that constructive criticism or critique or, you know, push them really hard to get to where they need to be, um, there just has to be that trust there where they trust you. They know that you have their best interest in mind. And that's what it sounds like uh, you have with a lot of your players and, and you get a lot more results that way when, when you have that relationship and your players trust you. So yeah, uh, yeah 100%. That makes, makes tons of sense. So let's, let's kind of get into uh, the, the post here and, and developing the post with, within your offense. So yeah. let, let's kind of break down first the role of, of a post player in your offense. Let's start with that first. What, what is a post player look like uh, within the realm of your offense? Well, every, every year it changes because it mm -hmm. depends on who you have, right? And yep. Um, if you have uh, a back to the basket big, because those those still exist up here, they're still around. I mean, we we're all looking for one. We're all looking for one that can get us easy buckets for sure. So if you have a back to the basket big, I think the like, you know, obviously what you're asking the big to do right off the bat is set great screens, box out, rebound, you know, challenge shots at the rim. Um, you know, if you're playing man to man. Hopefully they're guarding someone in the dunker spot. So they're the first uh, helper uh, on help side. Um, if you're in zone, then protecting the paint, patrolling the paint. Um, and then I think what you want next out of them is offensively, uh, you know, rim run, on, rim run and transition, right? Like a great rim runner and transition can open up your entire offense. It opens up dribble drive lanes. It opens up easy buckets when you pitch it ahead to the wings and they see the post players streaking down the middle of the floor for dunks, for layups. Um, and even in secondary transition, when that player runs to the rim, doesn't get the ball and seals and up seals their man and, and gets the ball in the post for easy buckets. I mean, that's the, the goal of any offense is just to get easy buckets, right? And mm -hmm. when you have a uh, back the basket big, that's the number one thing you want, right, is to get easy buckets as much as possible. 
Um, in your half court offense, again, that def- depends on your guards, right? Like what offense are you running? So, you know, in my time at cap, I think the best way for me to put it, like we, our best post player we ever had was a six foot five guard. And we took advantage of him in the post, uh, on almost every offensive sequence. So I built the entire offense on getting him the ball kind of in that T post area, you know, low post to high post area. If he just got, all we needed to do was get him the ball in that area. And he either was going to score, draw a double team or get into the paint and kick it. So like he had like, he it very much built like Carmel Anthony, like to be perfectly like give you an NBA comparison of what kind of player he was. He was my only all Canadian. Mm. And so like, um, I personally like try to figure out who my best post player is every year, whether that's the big or a guard. I don't even care. I just try to get them the ball in that area because anytime you can get someone in that area that can threaten the defense, the defense really reacts to players as they get closer and closer to the bucket. And like, if you have someone, no matter what size they are, you know, my, um, uh, philosophy is get them the ball in that area and, and see how the defense reacts and, and, and make reads. Mm. Um, how I get them the ball is, is uh, a variety of different ways. Again, I mentioned the rim run is the number one way, primary way. Um, two is just like if the guy just gets good position when he's running to the rim, just throw him the ball. Three, running action. So like we, you know, we've done give and go action. So where, you know, He's playing like kind of the trail post area, throws it to the wing, cuts to the bucket, seals. You know, we've had it, we've we've run we've run some shuffle offense, which is anytime um, in the shuffle, if there's a low post player and the ball gets reversed in the shuffle, the low post player then back screens for the um, for that post for that other post player, and they come off like a back screen and then mm-hmm. and then try to seal their man in that post area we've also run like little to big so we've run like you know if the big's on the opposite block via the ball the little will um dive to the middle of the paint and then he'll come off that cross screen for that pick a picker action usually uh, we we like to throw shooters to do that because then when you throw a shooter uh to set them to set that cross screen um the defense won't leave the shooter Right? right, and so the, the the post player will come off that uh, a lot cleaner than when you send a non shooter to do that. So mm-hmm. um, that's an ATO that we run uh, every year that I've been at Cap. We call it, you know, just, we you know, we just someone does does this or something like that, and we run that uh, just that little um, pick a picker action. But you know, so shuffle, pick a picker on an ATO, rim run. Um, give and go into the post and then get that give and go in the post. We also flash the opposite big for high low. Um, it's almost like a UCLA. It's, it feels like a UCLA yep. cut. Okay. Um, and then flash the opposite big high. And then we get that, that high low action. Um, not a lot, but we've, we've, we've got it. Um, this upcoming season, I'm hoping to land, and it's I know it's late in the year, but I'm hoping to land one big. But honestly, we're 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 going to be running guards into that area this this year. I can mm. already see it. Mm. Yeah, and and you bring up a, yeah. a really good point there about you know you got to be a little bit versatile and and know who your personnel is and know like what type of post totally. player you're you're going to get are you going to get that you know back to the basket big or are you going to get you know somebody like a the six five guard type who, who's going to be put put in that position so a hundred percent agree about the need to be versatile and so with that with that back to the basket big in the more like traditional sense of like the half court offense when they're yeah. when they're getting that post position do, have you found that you've needed to make changes in in the way that the the players post up is there a certain thing that you're looking for when they post up in terms of positioning in terms of hand placement or or how does that kind of look like for you um with with a traditional big so we had a six eight post player last year and he was skinny and so he had a hard time um sealing up the lane where so we couldn't throw it over the top to him and teams ended up playing behind him and just letting him get the ball because he wasn't able to back them down. Right. But what we tried to teach him was sealing up. So like spinning, like trying to get into the body 
on say a rim run and the, and then spinning either way off of their defender and then trying to get leverage where they could seal them up the lane towards the free throw line and we could throw it over the top. Mm. Um, he wasn't strong enough just to bury his man under the rim, which is for me on a rim run, the number one way I would teach it where you just tee up your, tee up your defender, get your elbows out and, and use your butt to basically show to the ball and show your chest to the ball with your flashers uh, and sealing right at the rim. Uh, hand placement, again, it's like if, if we get the defender on the right side, we're throwing the ball to, you know, two feet away from the left hand, right? Opposite mm -hmm. the side of the defender, two feet away. So, you know, always trying to teach sealing as close as possible to the rim because we're always going to throw the ball away from the offhand, away from the defender. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I yeah, yeah, sense. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And and so with with that, so they they get the ball and 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 they're able to get it. You know, back to back to the basket. How, for for you and your experience, how many moves counter moves are are you hoping that that traditional post player yeah. would have? Well, I mean, for all the young young coaches out there, the number one thing I think like to teach is just the jump hook, like. Um, I have a, a great coaching mentor friend named Spencer McKay who played for Team Canada up here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's one of the best big men ever to play for Team Canada. And he, uh, you know, thank, thank goodness I have him as a resource. He says to me, you got to have a jump hook. And so whatever hand you throw the ball to, that player needs to be able to drop step on that same hand, anchor, turn, keeping their shoulders between uh, the defender and the ball and just hook it in. So the deeper position you have, like you can't shoot a left-handed hook from 15 feet. You have to get, you know, six feet and under position and then be able to drop step on either, either one of those hands and, and just hook the ball, hook the ball in with a little baby jump hook. That's the number one thing. And no dribbling, no dribbling. That's the way I would teach it. That's the way I've taught it um, for years is jump hook first. Then as you perfect the jump hook, as you turn, and you feel the defender inching, inching inside to that jump hook, shading that jump hook. That's when you pivot with your inside foot, bring that ball, step through, finish. So now you have, now the defender has to think about your, your drop step jump hook and your drop step fake jump hook, step through, no dribble, layup. Um, those two are the, the base. Yep. And then you go from there. Um, for me, like we, work on those two and then we we go from there in terms of big man development well well with what you just said without the the players not being able to dribble then it it really emphasizes the the footwork aspect of it and the position and, and the way that yeah. they're positioned the way that their their foot moves is is there anything in particular that you're looking for within their footwork and the way that they're moving since you don't want them dribbling at least on that on that jump hook so um, finding, finding the defender's quad with their butt is really important, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so when you're sealing, if you have someone playing behind you, feeling what side they're on, right, and where their leverage is, and hopefully that you and the passer are on the same page and sealing away from that leverage. And, and when you drop your foot, dropping it, and, and hopefully pinning that defender right behind you. And you don't even have to make a jump hook at that point. You can just lay the ball in. Mm -hmm. So really using the defender's leverage against them. Um, using not elbows, but keeping those elbows square. And so when you do turn, you're turning with elbows. And those are important too, because that, that lets the defender know that they can't go close to you there and body up on you and be vertical on you because they're going to get elbowed in the chest as you turn, right? So usually using that drop step to turn is super important. I think like just the drop step in general with it, it, it is the number one way to uh, avoid turnovers for me, like, because then you're teaching your big men not to dribble. As soon as they dribble in the college league, right? If they, if they dribble, like if they get, if they have a move, they got two dribbles max, you know, cause if they take that third, it's getting turned over for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, and I think that that's a, it's a really good point to reemphasize in general for, for a lot of, of teams and a lot of um, programs, at least I know I, I've, I've had this as well, where there's over dribbling and there's like too much dribbling going on. And I think that what you just said sort of just reemphasizes again that if you can get into that move and just use your footwork, use your pivot, use the, the leverage, you don't need to use dribbling because like you said by the time you put the ball on the floor one or two dribbles max and then that that action or whatever the case may be is is not going to happen well, anymore. And the, the other thing coach is like when when they get it a bit further out and they haven't used their drop step the emphasis like especially with you know our player a few years ago like he's still going to be dribbling middle like he's still going to be crab dribbling one dribble middle and then getting into either another jump hook, and it's the same footwork. It's like you're going to dribble middle. If the defense is taking that away and you feel them on your inside shoulder, now you're going to spin back the other way mm -hmm. uh, away from the defense into a left jump hook or a, some sort of counter, like left-hand jump hook, step through counter. Mm -hmm. So um, you're always we always emphasize attacking middle. That way, when you get caught or you get pinched down on by a defender or you see it, like you'll see the, first, you'll see the double coming. Two, when the, when, if you, if you go baseline, your head's going to be completely turned. If you go middle, you'll sense, have a better sense of uh, if the passer's defender is pinching down on you, right? right? And as you go middle, you'll see the two shooters on the opposite side of the floor and we have – at CAP, we have post principles. So, like, any time uh, we throw the ball into the post, um, that player actually jet – I call it jet cuts. I don't know what you guys might call it. I mean, I don't know what you call it, Coach, but, like, jet cut is just a baseline cut or a middle cut from the passing position into the post. So that, that, okay. that passer cuts away from the defender – and it's just like that little Sacramento King action back in the day with Rick Adelman. Chris Weber will just lay the ball off to Peja or Doug Christie or Jay Will or whoever's cutting, and boom, you get a little layup off it because the post defender doesn't leave. Mm -hmm. If they react, now the post player's got a layup, right? So it's just a little give-and-go concept off right. of the post pass. So we, all, we do that, number one. And early in the season, we get, like, a lot of layups off that. Mm. And well, then – after that happens, we, we, cut the, we cut the opposite 45 guy down as well, which opens up the shooter really well on the weak side. So we have those post principles. Well, you, you bring up a, a, a good point that I was going to kind of bring up as a follow-up question there is that I know that with, with post play and you get, you get the, the player that's with the back to the basket, you have instances where the, the ball gets in the post and then – it's almost like it's a, it's a black hole and it's like, all right, the ball's in the post. This, this player's got to have to make a move because they have the ball now. But I think it's really important, yeah. as you mentioned, that it's important that that post player keeps their vision and understands other oh, actions yeah, that are sure. going on and understands what's happening as well. And so are you just trusting that that post player is, is just going to make the right decision based on the cuts and the things that are happening around them? Or are there certain principles where – the post player needs to understand, okay, if you see this, this, and this, like you have to make this decision, whether it's scoring, trying to score yeah, yourself or kick other, otherwise. You, you, I mean, you know, you're, you're hitting on a point where it's like, it's a year long process, mm -hmm. right? Where you're every day in practice, you're, you're, you're trying to teach, oh, on this play, I think you should have went, I think, I think you should have the jet cut. On this play, you weren't patient. You went into your move, you missed the jet cut. And you miss the, the 45 dive. So, like, you know, teaching patience, teaching uh, reads, um, you know, like going through those reads with the player is super important because every team's going to defend that player differently. And so, like, hopefully you can, like, show the player prior to the game. Like, usually Monday we watch tape. And on that tape, like, if there's, like, a ball screen coverage, a staggered screen coverage, flare screen coverage, any of those – coverages that the other team does I try to show my players so like if if they just played a team that posted them up a lot maybe we'll get to see what they do in terms of post defense right do they front the post do they play behind the post are they pinching down from the passer are they doubling from the weak side are they doubling baseline like all those things are are important to show you're big and then you know once the game starts you're just you're really just praying and hoping that they listened right 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you, you touched on a, a, on a point to that uh, I know a lot of coaches uh, have reemphasized about the, the need for having them look at film. And then also when they do yeah. make a mistake or they do make a decision that seems off is, is just asking them like, why did you, why did you make that decision and try and get a little insight oh, yeah. into their own thinking? Like, why did you not, you know, hit this cutter? Why did you go right into this move right away? And just trying to get the thought process understood because seems like it's a lot easier to correct once you understand what was going on in their head and you can almost put yourself in and, their shoes and it's fast right like it's a fast it's a fast read like a jet cuts like you got a second maybe half a second mm -hmm. to make that reaction play to see if the defender's looking at you if the cutter got a clean cut you know a clean break cut off the defender um you know we talk about like head positioning where's the defender's head positioning like those things are like snap you know like they are lightning fast reaction so like i always say like if there's a turnover and the player comes off they're usually you know mad or whatever and i usually well, what do you see there and then you know they'll go into their their uh sort of hierarchy of how they read the situation right mm -hmm. and if they don't have anything to say they know they just blew it and so you just leave them alone right so yeah yeah uh, yeah absolutely and, and, and sometimes there's too many things happening and they just mm -hmm. get overstimulated right like there's mm -hmm. too many people open like sometimes that's a bad thing <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and that there's just like so much going on and, and and there's so many opportunities or so many decisions they can make and like you said with these cuts sometimes they got to make that decision within a second and they just have to know right away what to do and it just doesn't happen and you know that's just right. part of the it's part of the process that those decisions are, are the process quickly. yeah absolutely and so with that um, with, with that big, that more like a traditional type big, I, I know that a lot of coaches, they, they really want to make sure that, um, that they get involved as, as much as they possibly can and that they're, they're, they're staying yeah. like active and they're staying, staying used. So it, do you have that same philosophy in that if, you know, you have your big who's rim running, like we've got to make sure that we, we get them the ball and reward them. We got to make sure that they're getting touches in the post to keep sure. involved. Is, is that something that you keep in mind in your philosophy? 100%. So if there's a good rim run and they don't get the ball, like the guards are going to get chewed out when they come off, right? Like uh, on tape, like we'll show it. Like, oh, here, here's, here's our player running, you know, down, down the pipe no one's even near him and we're taking a three point shot. Like that's, that's not the best use of his, of his time. Right. Like trying to really emphasize that like not early, but like throughout the game, like if they're running the rim, you need to get them, you need to get them the ball period. So that's just, yeah. I mean, we, uh, as a coaching staff, as a, you know, as a, as a philosophy in the game, it's part of the philosophy. And part of the issue is if you don't have an elite catcher too, right. Like, if the guy's got bad hands and you're trying to emphasize to your players, like, oh, you need to throw him the ball. Well, you know, they'll say to you, like, you know, you got to listen to your players, right? Like, they'll be like, well, you can't catch the ball. Uh, right? yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like football. It's like, you know, it's a football pass, right? Like, it's a hard, you're running like a, you know, you're running a go route mm -hmm. and you're a big and you don't know where your defender is because you're just looking at the rim. Your eyes are on the rim and you got to, like, catch the ball and finish. Like, that's not easy. So you have to drill it. Um, we do drills where... Uh, we got an Italian rim run drill, we call it. I, don't, I think I got it from a coach in Europe. I don't know why I call it that. But, you know, basically in the drill, the guards streak the wings, the bigs run right down the pipe, and the guards basically, like, throw really hard baseball passes at them be, to simulate what it would be like in the game. So, like, if they um, – if it's a ball outside their body, it's like, okay, how do you catch this ball? Like, two-foot jump stop, uh, you know, get your balance, find out where you are, you know, it's not, not every pass is going to be perfect right in your chest and you're just going to run and dunk it. Like, you know, really mm -hmm. um, trying to throw the ball outside of their body and make it more realistic to what the game's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To work on hands, right? I mean, right. that's, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we talk about like, all right, you know, you're going to you're gonna do this rim run and you're going to catch it and, you know, we're going to score and we're going to go the other end. Well, we've got to make sure the catching part <laughs> is done and, and not all passes are going to be clean. Like you 100%. said, not everything's going to go right into a perfect pocket or perfect window. And so, you know, just being able to catch when it's a little lower, a little outside you or whatever the case may be. Yeah, 100%. And, and like you said, I, <laughs> I listen to your players where that if that's a concern that they have, like, hey, like this player's not going to be able to catch the ball yeah like, put well, it in okay. we try to do that one once a week we try to do that one, mm -hmm. one once a week and 
the other thing that post players aren't always great at is like when they rebound the ball, because in the drill, you have to rebound the ball, mm -hmm. rebound your own miss and then outlet it. Right. And they're not great at outletting. So you have to teach them how to outlet. And then when you teach them how to outlet, make sure they're not taking any funny steps. Right. Like as soon as they outlet run straight, like that, uh, skill has to be taught like it's mm -hmm. like it's just like a skill like a jab step it's exactly as uh, a, a fine motor skill like they you know a lot of times bigs they'll throw the you know pass the ball to the outlet guys calling for the outlet and then they take a, a step to the outletter yeah. or they take a step away from the outletter like they're going to run to the corner you know mm -hmm. run right down the pipe so like just teaching that you know the lane running is very important Right. And, and if you drill that in and you, you keep repeating that over and over in, in practice, that decision, they won't have to it. think about it. And they won't have to think about it in the game. They'll know exactly their responsibility and they'll know exactly where they're running to. And it's not going to be something then, that have to think about. Throughout the season, as they get more and more comfortable with that rim run, you add a defender. And then now they're catch, making a hard catch with like a, what I would call like a 75% defender. Like, mm -hmm. just there as, like, a resistance to uh, what they're doing so they don't just get, get into auto moves, right? Like, they, they start to read the defender. So always, like, anytime we do anything, uh, any drill, we drill, like, the specifics of it, you know, one on O for a couple of weeks. And then once the players get comfortable with it, we start throwing uh, reads at them. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 100% makes sense, you know, making it as game-like and incorporating things that they're going to see in the game uh, with, within your practices. Yeah, that 100% yeah. makes sense. And so uh, a question that, that came up for me right. while, while you were um, explaining some of the different roles of, of some of your post players is uh, I'm thinking of a hypothetical situation here in which you have a player – who's that very uh, traditional big who you never want to see like outside five foot doing anything on offense. And then you might also have that yes. player who is, you, you kind of want them there in the post and maybe they have like a little bit of an outside game, but you know that they don't have really much that they can do back to the basket. Maybe they're really undersized, maybe they're really skinny. So what I'm thinking uh, is, does a coach in your opinion, if they have that traditional big who can't do much um, on the outside range, how much would you need to push that player out of that comfort zone? And, and conversely, that more undersized player, how much do you need to push them out of their comfort zone to be able to do something back to the basket? Or do you just sort of let it be as it is? Well, you know, that's a great question. So I think the number one thing that you have to figure out where – like in that sort of scoring area that we've been talking about where they feel comfortable. So like we have a few guys that are really good at facing up. So like if they can get a position, you know, kind of like 10 to 16 feet, cause like analytics are analytics for the NBA, right? Like analytics for high school basketball and analytics for college basketball is a lot different than the NBA. And you need to get people the ball close to the basket period. I, that's my philosophy. If you're shooting threes, the whole game, you're not going to, you know, it's going to be very difficult to win a, a state title or a provincial title at my level. Um, every offense in our league has uh, high post catches, low post catches, uh, high low action. Every team, every team runs it. And the teams that don't, they don't win. Mm. Um, so for some bigs, um, like we have a couple bigs that are good at facing up and shooting. So, you know, if they can get the ball in that area and let them play one-on-one -on -one in that area with the same post principles, we let them do that. Um, we also, uh, use them as like a lot more as screeners because they're going to have, uh, a bigger guy on them. So if they're any of their screening actions, whether it's a pin down, uh, flare screen, uh, cross screen, whatever they're setting, if they have a bigger defender on, defender on them, then if they switch that, if they switch that action, then our guards are going to have a bigger, a big man on them. And that's going to be an advantage for our guards. Mm. Um, when they're like, we have a few six, 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 seven, six, eight skinny guys. And those skinny guys, uh, the biggest thing I find when you're teaching, um, you know, long athletes like that is you're trying to figure out, um, or you're trying to teach them how to screen wide and screen tough, right? Because they're, uh, they don't have as much uh, beef on them as some of the traditional bigs. So like, you know, teaching them how to screen is really important because then they're really effective, right? Because then their, their defender has to, uh, call a coverage if they screen properly. So, 
the players, you know, if you, the, the more you can't, you don't have to fight through that, you know, screen and you get just, you just get screen. You have to have a coverage. Is the coverage switch? Is the coverage a drop coverage? What's the coverage? And then figuring out, you know, with your guards, how to exploit that coverage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're still really, really important because they're going to have a slower defender on them. Um, and then the other actions we run when we have uh, post players that aren't traditional post players, just tall, long dudes, uh, we, we have a lot of dribble, up, dribble handoff actions where they can pop, roll, whatever. Um, we have what's called gets. So, like, anytime we run an action, we can throw the ball to them and then cut. And so we have principles off of our gets. So, like, you throw the ball. Say there was an action where they set a screen. And it was, say, it's a flare screen. We don't get the flare. You just throw it to the big. And now there's a principle, like, you can either cut, like, a ball screen or you can cut to the basket or you can cut to guard and screen the guard. Mm -hmm. So there's three things you can do every time you throw it to a big. We call it, hey, go get it you go get it, right? You cut, you figure out how you're going to get it off that big. And that's really tough to guard because opposing teams look at that and they're like, okay, well, what do they actually do here? Well, they're doing three things. How do we cover those three things? Do we switch, you know, and then it gets into that whole um, terminology where they're trying to figure out what you do when you throw the ball into that area to that big guy. So right. um, those are things that we use more if we don't have a traditional big. Mm. Well, it, it kind of goes back to something that you you said a little bit earlier in that, you know, you might have this player who's, you know, re really dominating at a younger level, like getting 30 and 15, but if they're just doing this this one action and they, they don't know how to, like, set a screen or they don't know how to do these certain other things that you might be having a lot of success with that player, but we really have to work to pushing them outside of that, outside of that limited area because, for them to, to really improve and really get successful, they're going to have to incorporate these other skills and can't just be limited to the, this one particular skill set. Really. And so if coaches are looking at, at more of a younger level, if coaches are looking to, to, to kind of build a post player like from the ground up, they see somebody who they think has potential to be a post player, does – the do you think a coach should be like okay we we think that this guy has potential or this girl has potential so we're going to make sure our offense incorporates post play or do you, would you think that okay they have a system that works and yeah you have this post player that you could be using but you know maybe not change your whole system just because you think that you have a post player um, how, how would you, how would you go about that if you if a coach has somebody who they think might have potential to to being a really good post player? I think I think you have principles, right? Like so, like mm -hmm. the first principle we talked about on the on the interview was you know like as soon as our rim runner or five man gets the rebound, they're running right to the rim, and so that's a principle for all of them, no matter how how they are at running or how they are at posting up. That player needs to run to the rim. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they can't get a good rim run, their second option is to drag, do a little drag screen, little ball screen and see if they can get a, you know, some sort of miscommunication in the middle of the floor in that sort of secondary transition. So there's a primary transition, which is run to the rim. Secondary transition would be a uh, high ball screen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so those are things that we do every year, no matter what our, what our big man does, right? Like no matter what their skill set is. And we'd work around the big man's skill set depending on what type of player they are. So, like, if, if that five man's a really good shooter, then he's popping every time. Yeah. If the big man – yeah, if the big man's a great low post player, we really want him to run to the rim more. Um, and so for any offensive um, philosophy, it's like you have to establish what your philosophy is and how do you break out of every scenario. Um, the, the one thing I've – you know, I haven't done it yet, but I've been thinking about it a lot is, is at the youth level. And I know they do this in Europe is they try to, they teach everybody how to play guard and they teach everybody how to, how to do big stuff. Right. And that would be uh, something I would say to youth coaches is like, try to see who's good at uh, what. And, and maybe your six, six, four guy at, you know, 13, 14 years old is actually like your best guard, you know, and if he is, 
she is, put them out on the perimeter, right? And, and, and let them play out in the perimeter and, and be a bit more, um, not as rigid in your thinking about who's going down into that area to score. Well, you bring up such a such a great point, and and that I, I I think a lot a lot of coaches here have gotten away from this, which is great. But I but I know even when I was younger, you would have like traditional uh, I put that in air quotes like like a big man or, or big girl, and they were like thirteen years old, and they were like six three, and then while well, they got into high school, and then they were like the fourth shortest person on the team by then, and so you can't really necessarily pigeonhole yeah. old people because of their growth, because of their development, and no. you know growth spurts happen or growth stops happening, and and having skill sets uh, uh, to be able to do both, I think it's really important, and I think it also helps if a player knows those different skills because well if they do end up being a guard at least they know what what it looks like to be a post player because they learn those skills and they learn like what they were supposed to do and I think it just helps with their own basketball knowledge knowing all the different spots. 100%. And so um, I, I'm also thinking kind of as a as a question to add on to that for for younger coaches as well is there for for a player who let's say they they really have that that post you know traditional post skill set and you know they they're that player that's going to be there in the in, in the low post and and maybe more so back to the basket is is there like a a, a sales approach to that because I, I i'm wondering if that's something that that players really get excited about now is being that more traditional you know kind of getting getting down and dirty type player when everything seems to be so so open and spread out is, is there sort of a approach to, to selling that or or have you found in your experience that that players are, are are good and they trust you and they'll accept that role yeah i i find the latter like they're going to accept the coaching um yeah, it's not really like yeah. At the college level, they're there and they're they're trusting you and they believe in you to put them in the best position to be successful. Um, and and by that point in their in their stage, like in their development, they're kind of knowing who they are, right? Like they're not a hundred percent sure what type of player they are, but like you you do have an idea um, that this is probably the best role for you. And they and yeah, there's not really a lot of. Um, uh, I guess, get back from them. You know, like they, they just believe and they try to do it. And we try to tinker with it as much as possible and make it as, make it as, um, make it as, as, as good as possible for them to have success. And, and so with then with like the, the, the U 17s or, or, or the younger one, uh, the, the younger grade levels, yeah. is that, still still something that you found is that like that they're willing to accept and right. i know that they're not necessarily going to be like all always like back to the basket ones but if their role is like hey i need you to do some more of the dirty work and, and do this um do this down low even if the young younger ages you, you found success with selling that for a lack of a better term yeah so that yeah, that's a good question. So like in my, I had a team a couple of years ago, U15 team, where we had a couple of plateaued um, guards that were like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, guards mm -hmm. um, that I had to use in the post. And I basically formed the question as like, well, look, we, we have perimeter playmakers. These perimeter playmakers are better than you at this stage of your career right now at making plays in the perimeter. What you guys can be good at is – bullying your defender right in the post or being passers playmakers in the post with our post principles so we didn't even we, we'd throw the ball to them and they wouldn't try to score we'd have our cutters and they'd be hitting the cutters right mm -hmm. or they'd draw the defense and hit a three-point shooter so like putting them in a position where they're still playmaking just in, in an area that's more uh, at that time in their careers, comfortable for them to make 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 uh, make reads and make plays. So, yeah, you're, that's a yeah. We 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 would put them in uh, that that team specifically. The, all those bigs could shoot too, so we popped them a lot. We ran those gets that I was talking about, uh, and when we threw the ball to the post, we had more intricate cutting. Like we had the jet cut, and then we had like a shape up screen on the weak side where the screener could dive, and like it was just a bit more. Um, a bit more action 
um, for, for someone to take in, but because they were guards on their high school teams and dribbled the ball and handled the ball and made reads all the time, they, they were, you know, really able to make those reads effectively. And, and we had a quite a good scoring team. Hmm. Well, yeah. I, I think that goes to these, this idea of, you know, when you have that relationship with, with your players and you're like, look, like this is where you're at, but this is where you can be like the most successful. Like if, if this is, you know, if you want to be the most successful for this team and be out there uh, playing, like we need you to serve this role uh, right now. And then, you know, things change, like you said, with yeah. people's development, but I think it's just kind of the way that you sell it and the way that you say, like, this is what you need and, and you do this role, like, you're going to get yours and you're going to get your opportunities as well, but this is what we need from, from you for, for everyone to be the most successful. I think it's just kind of the way that you, you, you sell it in that way. Yeah, and I think the other, the other, like, the sell piece, you know, like, you talk about selling it, like, when they're playing in that trail post area too you know you give them the freedom to like when you can you know if you can you know if you can shoot it and you're open shoot it mm -hmm. and, and you, you let them shoot it and you let them uh try to drive one-on-one -on -one in that trail post area mm -hmm. or you let them um you know follow with a ball screen and pop and then shoot it if they're open so like yeah. in that in those transition scenarios you let them be who they are and in the set offense, you try to put them in those other positions, but then make them playmakers in those positions. Mm, yeah. It's, yeah. All yeah. about having them be, be in the, the best positions to be successful. And then, like you said, yeah. when, it, when it is, you know, whether it's in transition or, or these other non-set situations, like, well, here you go. Like, you, you, let's, let's see, what, see what you're capable of and, and make the right decision um, when things aren't as set up. So, yeah. Makes yeah and every, makes every, every, every base offense that I've, uh, you know, constructed or copied or stolen from other coaches. Like I always try to make every player in that offensive threat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the players that buy in and understand, they, they see right away like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to get the ball in these areas and these are good areas to score in for me. And that's all, that's the, all the buy-in you need, right? Like that you, you're, you're not just a, a decoy out here. Yeah. Well, a hundred percent agree with that about making everyone a threat because, if you don't and there's film on you, I feel like you're, that's going to get exposed really quickly if a player just right. exists just to exist on the court. And, and right. yeah, a, a good coach who looks at film is going to be able to pick up on that pre pretty quickly. So, yeah, great point that you mentioned. Um, and, and so and, and this is more of a general sense here as my last question. For There are coaches, I, I know, <laughs> I've, I've coached against them, uh, and, and I know some, and I've probably been this way too, who just have completely gotten away from post play, and they're like, everything's spread, where we don't do anything with the post, post is dead, we, we don't need any of that, we're just going to be completely five out spread and, and go from there. What would you say those coaches might be missing out on by not developing a post player or having some sort of post action in their offense? Um, I would say that you're just missing out on some opportunities for easy baskets. Um, there's still easy, but there's obviously lots of uh, ways to get easy buckets in, in a five out scenario. There's a lot more driving lanes. There's a lot more uh, drive and kick opportunities, closeout opportunities. Um, but if you have a, you know, if you develop a player that can rim run ball screen and, and, and roll the rim, those gets that I talked about, dribble handoff, roll the rim, all those things are just like dribble penetration. They put pressure on the on the structure of a opposing team's defense. And anytime there's pressure in, in the lane in basketball, someone has to help. And, and when someone has to help, that means that someone else, someone's open. And if no one helps, you got to lay up. And it's as simple as that when it comes to uh, rolling, running to the rim, anything like that. Like, I love, I love a great rim run. You know, mm -hmm. even in a five-out set, like I, I've seen coaches um, teach, like you run to the rim if you haven't, if you don't got it, then run to the corner. And now you're in your five-out action. So mm -hmm. even in a five-out action, you can teach someone on the floor. Say you're doing, uh, we call it circle the wagon up here, where you have, you know, your your five players kind of running around a circle in the free throw line, and you shoot a free throw. And then as soon as they catch it, whoever's closest to the rim, you teach that's the player that's running to the rim that just that pressure of the player running to the rim could take one defender and open up a lane. Mm. Right. And so you could teach even in a five out scenario, just the rim run 
where the player runs the rim. If they don't get it, then they get to the corner. And now you're still in your five out uh, read and react type uh, offense. So there's, there's ways to, I think, incorporate um, rim running and post play, even in a five out scenario. Like mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that, that's... we ran some five out lap. We ran out, we ran five out last year with a post player and we called it kind of the Jokic spot. And so we talked a lot <laughs> yeah. about like, yeah, like being a playmaker at the five spot because you know you're not going to get as pressured as much from that position as well too, right? So it's creating a new area of post play out on the perimeter. Right. And that, that's very much uh, read and react based right there. I, I know that that's a huge principle about, okay, you, you, you pass, you cut, and then now you can make a decision if you want, if you want to post up, if yeah. you want to do this, that, or the other. So uh, yeah, the, there are opportunities there, but, but, but like you said, I, I think that there is um, a, a big, op big opportunity by incorporating some post play because as you mentioned about the, the baskets and, and, and the looks that you can get by, by having post action and, and being able to you know, see, see the cuts and run a bunch of different things and, and just having that pressure. Like you said, if you have somebody who has the ball and they're relatively close to the basket, there's almost this natural pressure that's there or has to be accounted for. Um, the last thing I actually did want to mention um, because we, we talked a little bit about screening. Do you have a, a philosophy when it comes to setting screens or setting picks? Is there a way that it needs to look like for you? Because I know every coach is a little bit different, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Be wide, uh, sprint to your screen, feet, uh, you know, if it's a ball screen, feet, like feet positioning is really important. So the player has to choose whether they're going to fight over or go under ice, whatever their, their coverage is. So like, Feet positioning, be wide, and sprint to the screen are three things that we teach. Thank you very much for mentioning the sprint to the screen. I think that that's something that <laughs> I know it drives me crazy personally. And it's just funny, even in practice, when I've yeah. had that where you're going to go set a screen and they're, they're at a snail's pace. I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> that's not how we're going to set that screen and sprint to your screen. The sense of urgency yeah. when setting a screen, I think, is, is, is great. So thank you, for <laughs> thank you for reaffirming that thought that I had. <laughs> um, so to wrap up, uh, what I would like to do, uh, a couple of questions. Coach, first off, what is a coaching moment from your coaching career that you think others listening would be able to learn from? Um, moment, I would say, um, I would say like for late game scenarios, ha teach, uh, you know, teach your sideline baseline out of bounds with counters because in a late game scenario the bullets are flying the defense is flying around you know you, there there's lots of different things that happen really really fast mm -hmm. and i would say make sure you have counters built into your uh sideline and baseline out of bounds um because if you don't and things stop and 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 people aren't open things are you're going to turn the ball over you're going to get a five second count mm. that would be I've, I've experienced that the hard way, and I would say make sure you have counters built into all your sideline, baseline, out of bounds that you use late in game. Well, it makes a lot of sense too if you if you're running a uh, if you're running a out of bounds play and you've ran it you know five times already and you know it's it's in the third quarter and that team's seen it and they know what that action's going to look like. It just makes sense that you would have some sort of counter or just some sort of alternative to go through. So absolutely, that's that's a great point to bring up. And then finally, uh, what I give uh, every coach is what I call a 60-second soapbox where the floor is yours to discuss or get out any final thought, any uh, final idea, closing message, and any sort of final thought that you want to give. So, Coach, I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor. Uh, go ahead and take it away. Well, I think because we were talking about post-play today, I would say to all the coaches out there that there's creative ways to – uh, use your post. Uh, like I said earlier, like we use, we we're going to use some shuffle offense this year to get our guards in the post because I can see that we don't have a traditional post player. So like in the shuffle offense, you can still get into spread formations, spread ball screen, Spain ball screen, five out scenarios in the shuffle set. So like any, any, you know, I, I know with the flex offense, it's a little bit more tough uh, in, in terms of continuity, but like, uh, there, there's lots of ways to still use the post. I know a lot of coaches are using that um, ball screen continuity offense, the Australian ball screen continuity offense. 
my emphasis for that would be like build counters, post counters into that offense. So you have your five out that you really like and spread the floor and all that stuff, but you still have uh, post players uh, getting back screens uh, through from cutters or you get post players uh, diving to the rim for easy layups. You should always be uh, trying to get as many easy layup opportunities as possible for your team. And, and sometimes using that tallest player or using like a really skilled guard to do that is, you know, I'm all for it. Just be flexible. Great, great, great thought. Great, great closing thought about be, being flexible and, and, and just looking for the, for the opportunities where, where you can get them and, and just taking advantage of, of those, yeah. those easy looks and the, those easy baskets because those are the best ones. The easy baskets are the ones that are, yeah. are the best ones to get. So great. Um, so coach, I, I want to thank you again for, for spending some time talking about uh, post play, uh, about so much more beyond that as well. It was, it was a really great conversation. Really appreciate it. Um, coach Kanemeyer, thank you so so much good luck going forward thank Hopefully you. you have some games to coach and best mm -hmm. of luck with everything going forward thank you coach thanks for having me on i appreciate it absolutely this is great uh this was another edition of the basketball teacher podcast thank you guys so much for joining us we will see you next time thank you for listening to another edition of the basketball teacher podcast Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.